Hello, welcome. Uh, you are listening to Talking Shop, a resource for trade union activists and organisers. My name is Chris, I am a teacher and I am also organising in education at the moment. I'm Dave Pike, I'm organising in education as well as an official for the National Education Union. I'm Lydia, um, I'm the Women's Officer and a rep for the London IWW branch. Ownership, or more accurately dispossession, is the first and central cause of class division and conflict. Our economies have not only produced advanced systems for the distribution of material and social goods, food, housing, energy, transport, care, but also reproduced and reinforced systems of dominance and control. Throughout history, all manners of elites, from emperors to churches, monarchs, states and castes, have wrested control of vital social industries, land and resources, and in doing so perpetuated relationships of subordination and dependence to themselves. Accordingly, the socialist movement has and continues to maintain that the transference of all vital industries, the means of production, out of private hands and into common ownership is the ultimate and historic goal. The means and methods have differed, of course, but whether through workers' councils, union federations, communes or nationalised industries, common ownership has always been at the horizon of socialist struggle. Yet from the standpoint of the day-to-day -day issues that concern trade union organisers, questions of ownership seem like pie-in-the-sky thinking, a little too abstract and theoretical when compared to more immediate issues such as wages, pensions and working hours that tend to get workers mobilised and also animate campaigns. But is it possible to organise around the issue of ownership in a more concrete and practical way? in a way that possibly speaks to the same importing and pressing bread and butter issues, but also paves the way to more radical and transformative activity. Worker-run cooperatives and trade union buyouts offer some practical examples. The Meidner Plan represents another at attempt to integrate the socialisation of industries into the traditional bargaining position of trade unions. These also provoke poss possible criticisms as well. Do worker-run cooperatives, for example, really offer a different economic model or just a better means of organising our own exploitation? Are such proposals realistic and practical, especially when considering the huge complexities of the modern economy and its deep reliance on global systems of communication, financing and trade? Can ownership be used as an intermediary demand or does it demand greater and more fundamental political and social transformations first? These are the questions, among others, that we will be discussing and attempting to ask a answer in this month's episode of Talking Shop, which is titled Ownership. Um, so we're starting off. Uh, Lydia is going to talk a little bit about one of those practical examples, which is cooperatives and what potential uh, benefits and drawbacks cooperatives offer um, to trade union activists or indeed the socialist or workers movement. Yeah, I guess... Uh, in podcasts as in life I'm going to be a uh, killjoy and make a critique of worker ownership as modelled by cooperatives on the grounds that it's a form of self-exploitation and reproduces capitalist relations. If the goal of the IWW is to end the wage relation this isn't a desirable outcome. I guess I should start by saying I'm not an accelerationist I'm not sure who is uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think we have a responsibility to struggle for day-to-day -day improvements to our lives, as well as for the big stuff. If we do this in the right way, we can show each other that we can fight and win, and increase our capacity to fight for more. If you have a higher wage, shorter hours, secure housing, childcare and healthcare, you're more likely to have time, energy and confidence to, end, to attend an organiser training or a union meeting. Uh, low wages and precarity are a tool of discipline that we have to dismantle. All of us would rather work in more egalitarian workplaces where there are no bosses. Our lives would definitely be improved by it on a day-to-day -day basis. I'd argue that there are major drawbacks to the co-op model though, uh, in the short term and the long term, that undermine them as a model for liberation from these kinds of exploitation. Um, the drawbacks all stem from the same place, kind of as I see it, which is that a cooperatively run workplace under capitalism is still subject to market forces. Um, 
in order for the cooperative to compete with conventional businesses, which are operate at larger economies of scale, there'll be pressures to keep costs down. Um, that can be through low wages, poor benefits, possible exploitation further down the supply chain. As an IWW member, what I want is the abolition of the wage system. Thanks, uh, preamble. Uh, the wages <laughs> in a cooperative may be set in a notionally democratic manner, but they still constitute a wage relation. In fact, in some ways, cooperatives reinforce the idea that it's the hi only the hi hierarchical nature of most workplaces, which is bad, obscuring the exploitative and disciplining force of the wage, however it's administered. Um, this obscuring of relations is a problem in other ways. Back to our beloved preamble. Uh, the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. Uh, between these two classes, a struggle must go on until the workers of the world organise as a class, take possession of the means of production, abolish the wage system and live in harmony with the earth. It's this class antagonism which forms the basis of class struggle and which is all too, uh, all too evident in most of our workplaces. In a co-op, though, you're a worker, but you're also a boss. This muddying of class relations removes the immediate imperative to struggle, and who would you even struggle against? Monjagon in northern Spain is the largest cooperative in the world, and it provides some useful examples of the problems this can cause. In 2009, during the financial crisis, workers in one Mondragon company voted to give up four weeks of pay and to cut their own salaries by 8%. If times were tough with the company that you worked for and your boss demanded that you give up four weeks of pay, wouldn't you get organised with your colleagues or maybe go on strike? Um, workers there can't do that. They voted to give up these, this pay uh, themselves. Uh, workers in a cooperative are subject to the whims of the market, just like other workers. The difference is when the market disadvantages them, they don't have the ability to fight back in the same way. Surely, as WOBs, we can't get excited about any initiatives which remove our power to resist and struggle in our workplaces. As a cooperative member, you're also a boss, sometimes in a very conventional way. Two-thirds of Mondragon workers and non-member employees who are more vulnerable to job losses, pay cuts and unfavourable changes to conditions. A friend of mine worked there on a temporary contract, and I don't think her experience of work was meaningfully different than it would have been in a conventional company. Imagine being a member worker there as a WOB and being part of a decision to lay people off or to cut pay. If they brought their union in, you'd be sitting on the wrong side of the negotiating table. As much as I'd never begrudge anyone from joining a workers' co-op to improve their quality of life, I don't see it as a viable strategy to achieve the aims of the IWW or any revolutionary union. I think a prolifer prolif God, proliferation of co-ops could undermine class struggle in this serious way. I still think our focus should be on organising where we are, improving conditions on a day-to-day -day basis and increasing confidence using all the tools of struggle at our disposal as workers. Um, before we before we discuss that, I thought it was worth clarifying uh, a number of the, or a couple of the terms that you mm. use, Lydia. Um, so um, one, one, one just, just that we use all the time and probably have used in the past in this podcast, uh, WOB or Wobbly is the nickname for people who are members of the IWW. Uh, has been used historically to represent IWW members. There's various myths and legends about where it comes from, but that tends to be what it what it means. Um, you some racist, some not. <laughs> yeah, some racist, some less racist than others. <laughs> um, I think I think like the kindest the kindest one is you're wobbling the job as in you're yeah. making the workplace that's unstable. definitely the kindest one we'll, yeah. not, yeah. the other one. we'll not talk about, we'll not the, talk other about the other one we don't endorse the racist <laughs> one <laughs> the, other, the other one is fake news yeah <laughs> um, the you at the beginning you you um, you caveated your statement by saying that you weren't an accelerationist I think it's worth uh, maybe explaining what that means but also mm. why y you said that yeah um, so accelerationists, whoever they are, I'm not convinced at this point that they really exist, um, <laughs> think that, um, you know, as things get worse and worse and worse, people will be more, um, more willing to struggle that basically like things have to get worse before they get better. Um, and I wanted to clarify that, you know, that's not, that's not my position. 
I understand why people would want to work for a co-op. Like it's obviously a much better place to work in a lot of ways than a conventional business. Um, I'm not saying we all have to, I'm happy with us all kind of toiling away and like for terrible companies with terrible conditions and that's what will give us the impetus to strike back. Um, yeah, so that's that's why I wanted to to clarify that really. Okay. I mean, it's quite an old idea in a way. It's, yeah. it's, and it is it is relevant to this. So, you know, Marx puts forward uh, his immiseration thesis, which is basically the idea that, I mean, immiseration is quite a good word, isn't it? Mm. The yeah. more miserable and poor you yeah, become, yeah. Yeah. the idea is you'll see revolution as more uh, desirable. Yeah. Um, but I think, I'm not sure Marx was even completely convinced of that idea. No, that I mean, life, I, but... I, I have, over the over my years in the left, I've, I've met two. So that definitely... <laughs> puts it down oh two accelerationists two ex- accelerationists yeah. and there were both people who got annoyed at me for organising and were basically like well why bother yeah amazing because it's, it's it'll just happen so. yeah so there's an element of kind <laughs> yeah, of yeah. Cool. faith in spontaneity yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah you don't need to do anything because at some point it'll all just magically happen yeah yeah um, I'm sure that's fine so- <laughs> I'm sure that will happen so I have I have a question for you, um, Lydia. Based yeah. on so you, obviously your your analysis of of cooperatives was um, a kind of majority part quite negative. Um, mm. We had an article um, on the blog that was contributed uh, it was probably a few months ago now, mm. but it was kind of suggesting that cooperatives could operate as a kind of wedge um, vehicle. So you could use cooperatives to raise the, the expectations of the standards of wages, the quality of work that you would get in certain industries, and then that would have a knock-on effect on the rest of the economy. And also that cooperatives presented an alternative model that workers in other industries could use mm. to kind of argue for better conditions. Do you, are you not convinced by that argument? I'm anything that undermines undermines the hegemony of work as we understand it is a good thing um but i don't think it outweighs necessarily the criticisms of them as being like lowering potential for struggle yeah and also like is is the is that it's very it's all well and good suggesting that strategy right but who's Mm. who's enacting that strategy yeah Yeah. there's no there's no sort of centralized committee and you know yeah, I don't mean that in a Leninist way. I just mean there's there's no sort of guiding ideal. Yeah, saying we need to use we need to use cooperatives to change the way people view work. That's yeah. it's just not happening. Although to, to be fair, yeah, to be I, fair to the author though, no, no, I think I, he was he was suggesting that this should be yeah, yeah, a strategy yeah. that's adopted by the trade union yeah. movement. And I suppose I, I mean I'm not particularly convinced by the argument, but one thing that I think is raised by that article and is useful and is partly the reason why I wanted us to discuss ownership is that this is not really something that the trade union movement really talks mm. about at all not not anymore now no not anymore and it's there's no big picture thinking that kind of really goes on at all so I suppose the idea that at least support for cooperatives and acknowledgement that cooperatives are part of the workers movement <laughs> is a way of bridging that gap to thinking about what well, actually can trade union activity be a bit more substantive, yeah. go further mm. than simply fighting over workplace conditions. Mm. Yeah. You know, can it be something different? Yeah, because I, I think, I think my, my criticism of co-ops has always been <clears throat> in a rear, it, it, on the ground, does it not just become a lefty ghetto, right? You know, does yeah. it not just become somewhere lefties go to retire? Like Bristol, you know, <laughs> is it just somewhere people move to? Are you suggesting that Bristol is an entirely corrupt <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Take that, Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's one of these places where people are. Oh, I'm really exhausted of all this activism. Yeah, I'm gonna go and work in a co-op so yeah. I don't have to do anything. Yeah. Or I'm or I'm really sick of rent yeah. and having to deal with rent all the time. I'm gonna move into a co-op. Yeah. Like. I get it, like, 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 like Lydia, like, like you very astutely said, like, totally understand why people would do that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's exhausting. 
and it is tiring mm. and sometimes you do just want things to be a bit easier yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that um but it doesn't it just doesn't it just create a lefty ghetto i don't yeah. know i, don't I mean it's it, it's a, it's bad but and this is very unfair i'm sure to the cooperative movement mm. which is you know it goes back yeah, yeah, yeah. a long time yeah. right it's a historic movement but it's not just supermarkets <laughs> <laughs> well that i mean that could be discussed in itself right yeah but when you when you say cooperative I d- and i don't know whether you share this but the first three things that come into my my head are bicycle cooperative yeah veg shop yeah bookshop yeah right and these are not these are not and that's cynical but these are not vital industries are they maybe the veg shop i suppose but they're not going to reorganize the economy they're not going to it's not going to bring the economy to standstill if you can't get an organic swede <laughs> <laughs> sorry this is turning into our bitchiest podcast yeah. <laughs> but if you look at so the... much shade in this podcast <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the um Mondragon example though I mean they are producing on a really large scale they're a massive part of the economy in northern Spain and that's because they have loads of non-member workers like over two thirds um and I think at that point, I'm not sure what use it is as an example of how things could be different because over two thirds of the workers don't experience anything different. And I actually think, you know, if you're a, you know, if you're a lefty, if you're a, you know, you would be a trade unionist and you're sat like on the opposite side of a negotiating table from, from, you know, workers who are having their pay and conditions cut by you, who's in a really privileged position as a member and, um, you know, can take part in democracy. I mean, I just think that's, what use is that as an example? Like, how does that help anyone? So I don't know if that's an issue with the scale, just, I mean, it's a cooperative on a scale that I think we're not used to, you know, it's not on the scale of an organic veg shop or a bookshop. I don't know whether it's a problem inherent to its scale. Um, yeah. Although, I, I, actually not necessarily because um, uh, I, I, I used to work for a cooperative. It was a veg shop. It was an organic veg shop. <laughs> um, the, they, they employed me as a, as a wage worker um, on very close to minimum wage. That was a tiny cooperative. It was maybe 10 workers, mm-hmm. I think, who were cooperative members they still had to employ uh, three wage workers as part of it. And it was because they, it, they that was their way of adapting to the marketplace. Mm. They needed a layer of worker who was on less privileged conditions, yeah. who could cover those more intensive hours of working. They couldn't ultimately afford to do that with a cooperative member. Mm. It, their balance sheets didn't work. So yeah. I think even even smaller businesses feel those economic pressures to i suppose what we're saying is that actually whereas cooperative should be a counter model an alternative to mm. most businesses what in reality they do is they they're forced into the mold of what is going on in the market at the time yeah. and that, and yes they may in many cases be better places to work in lots of instances mm. but they they're kind of shaped by the market that's around them and you see that in housing as well mm. um, i was having a very interesting discussion with uh, someone I know who who lives in a housing cooperative, and they had a very interesting relationship with uh, landlord licensing that was mm. going on, because they were kind of begrudging this landlord licensing because it was basically forcing them to make adaptations to this cooperative owned house, adaptations that me as someone who rents, I would very much like to see. You know, yeah. I want double glazing. I want you know proper fire doors I want you know all of these things to make me safer and warmer um, and it cheaper for me to live in my house and my landlord to act in a more responsible way but for them they own that house so that's yeah. expense that's cost you know and it, so it actually the, even in housing I think you get those same economic pressures yeah and you can very quickly find yourself in a situation where <clears throat> actually the one that you're describing the veg shop that you're talking about um other veg shops are available. Yeah. And uh, and uh, and the Spanish example as well. You know, you're basically talking about managers with share options. Yeah. That's not an that's not an alternative model. That is just capitalism. That yeah. that that's that's a repetition of something that exists in tons of businesses. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um yeah, the managers with an even more invested interest in the company doing well. Mm. Yeah. Um 
Yeah, and I, and and it and, and it does it does bring into a very, situation very quickly where you have unions against management against the cooperative. Yeah, you know, in the situation the 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 housing situation that you're talking about, you can very quickly see a situation where you've got a housing co-op on one side and Acorn, for example, on the other. You know, you, you very yeah. quickly find a position where <laughs> you're actually fighting unions and co-ops are in a, uh, on either side of the table, similar to what you were describing mm. with you as well. Yeah. I mean, it's it's maybe, going back to the point you made um, earlier, Lydia, about how um, it's kind of market forces yeah. that shape yeah. these things. I think that's a really vital point and probably something to bear in mind for the next two points that we talk mm. about as well, that the market is a very important part of how capitalism operates. Mm. Um, I don't want to get overly theoretical, but you know, part of Marx's argument in Capital is that capitalism has a social logic, a rule of the game, that applies as much as to the working class as it does to capitalists. Mm. Mm. Capitalists have to be profitable. You have to adapt. You have to be competitive. You are compelled to do that because if you don't do that, someone else is going to do your business better and they're going to put you out of business. So this this social logic that we all op operate with, it works within the market, it works within the law, it works within the state structures, it compels everything to work in a certain way. So one, I think the recurring problem that maybe all of these things we're going to look at is going to be how do you break out of that circuit? Yeah. Um, and is it possible to kind of go further resisting those compulsions? Yeah, and, and I don't know. I feel I feel like it's similar to what you were saying at the start, Lydia. I do feel like I've been needlessly negative now because there is some great examples of co-ops doing fantastic stuff. Yeah. You know, like oh, for sure. Uh, help and and obviously this is relevant to later podcasts we're going to do, but like the role that has for sex workers, for example, is mm -hmm. really important. You know, and it is, and that is very much them taking back control of their of their industry. Mm. Yeah. But but. You know, I, I guess maybe it's you know it's a case by case basis rather than yeah. broad brush. But I'd, yeah, I yeah. do. Yeah, really agree with your points there. Okay, are we ready to move on? Yeah. Okay. So um, Dave's going to talk about trade union buyouts as another possible example. Yeah. So I mean, this 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 does feed a lot into what we've already talked about. So it, it, it probably will echo some of the stuff we've we've spoken about already. Um, but I wanted to look at a, a very specific example um, in the UK context, uh, Tower Colliery, um, which is the oldest deep, uh, deep mine in the UK, uh, based in the based in the south of Wales, had over two hundred thirty miners, and uh, the coal board, at the behest of Thatcher government, planned to close the mine, and described it as uneconomical. Um, but Despite the resistance from Thatcher, the government and the coal board um, to this idea, it was eventually purchased by 239 miners in 1995 um, in a worker buyout, um, which was backed by the NUM locally and uh, I think funds were raised as well. Um, so, but it was essentially organised by like a, a central group of the dedicated original starters who'd put in their redundancy payments into a pot to, to get the ball rolling. Um, and it meant that in, straight away there was a hierarchy there. Um, and that's something I'll come back to later as well. So the worker owned Colliery. It lasted 13 years and eventually closed in 2008. Um, and to be fair to them as well, did prove economically viable way beyond the estimations of the coal board which you know anyone who knows the history of uh, mining in this country will that won't be a surprise to um, and they actually ran at a profit of something around four million so they were doing very well for, for a lot of that time um, however uh, there's some really interesting interviews being done with people who are involved in that um, one of which um, was the NUM's lodge secretary at the time from the Tower Colliery and he said that um, there was there was huge improvements due to this change in ownership that made it easier to make changes, improve the relationship between workers and management. Um, however, he also stated that ultimately, manage uh, that a manager is a manager, and and that relationship maintained, um, and that the union was downgraded to a peacemaker, and that they 
simply just didn't want to go on strike. That, that, that was no longer an option once they considered themselves owners. And actually that stakeholder mentality really took hold in, really took hold in the sort of workers' mentality, um, even in an extremely militant and well-organised workplace like that. So I think that is something worth exploring as well. Um, this was also, uh, there was also a consistency with the management structure, um, partly because of some of the legal structures in this country that mean that to be a manager in a colliery, you have to have certain legal, you have to have certain qualifications as a legal requirement. And it meant that all those managers stayed the same. So the people who were managers before the buyout were managers afterwards. There was never any democratization of that. They were just maintained as the managers. Um, and one of the things this NUM secretary talks about is he talks about how um, one thing that they found difficult, that the workers themselves found difficult, is that they were stakeholders only in the stakeholder meetings. They weren't stakeholders on a day-to-day -day basis, which again, just it continues this, this sort of capitalist mentality. You don't democratise the job. You're, you, yes, you have ownership over the uh, company, but that doesn't democratise the day-to-day -day job. The managers mm. still make the day-to-day -day decisions. Yeah, um, And these played out in constant tensions between democracy and what's been described as organisational effectiveness, which was obviously required by the market, which coming back to what we've said. Mm. Um, there's a really great book called Alternative Work Organisation, um, which is a, a, a collection of, uh, of essays, one of which is about the Tower Colliery. Um, and discuss this in detail. You can actually find it online. It's worth having a read. Um, but one of the really interesting things that came when I was sort of reading around this was um, actually some more established, well, not I guess not more established, but some of the sort of fringe views in the, in the, in the uh, views of miners around, around the ideas of ownership. And there's actually a, a fantastic pamphlet from 1912 um, by a group called the Unofficial Reform Committee, which I just think is just an amazing. <laughs> name. I'm, I'm so in love with that name. That's very British. Isn't it's, it? it's so <laughs> good. We can't it's call so... ourselves the official. Reform no, Committee. We haven't. We haven't been approved. We haven't been approved. But that's like this British it's, insurgency, it's, isn't yeah. it? It's like that's true revolution. Unofficial. It's We're unofficial. unofficial. Yeah. <laughs> Despite their politeness, they had some they had some fantastically radical ideas. And actually, they, they wrote this pamphlet called The Miner's Next Step in 1912. And it argued against the ideas of nationalisation. Interestingly, talking about how as a model of ownership, it was simply a way of diluting the true aim of workers' control and that unions should be demanding direct control over their industries. And... I do find it interesting looking at that article and then seeing what happened at the Tower Colliery. Um, I do wonder how the people of the unofficial reform committee would have viewed this buyout, whether it would have been what they were looking for. And, and, and sadly, I don't think it would have been. You know, And I think we sort of come back to these same issues that we've talked about more generally in the cooperative movement, that we're not really talking about mean real ownership. You know, We're not really talking about uh, we're talking about a very diluted form of ownership. Yeah. Um, and as syndicalists, you know, ultimately what we're demanding is our union to have control over our industries, our unions to have control over those industries and ultimately democratise them. Yeah. And actually, you know, I don't think that's what happened here. I don't mm -hmm. think that's what happens so much in, in especially in larger cooperatives. Um, you know, obviously, again, as I said earlier, there's, there's examples where that, that is the case. Um but yeah, I just think it's an interesting example to discuss how in practical terms, an extremely politicised workforce that had a very, very strong base, very well organised, mm. still was just eaten up by this idea. Um, and it does feed into a lot of the things you were saying earlier as well, Lydia. Yeah. Mm. Uh, quick question. Do you get, why didn't other colleagues really do this? Was it just, mm. was this a bit of a novelty? Was this something that they had the economic means to do yeah i think i think it was partly that okay i think i think they were um there's been a lot of other attempts to buy out um collieries and mm -hmm. it's not worked it's failed right. so okay. i i think this because it was the oldest and very well established had lot had had by all accounts had very strong economic value right um 
they were able to get the funds together for it. Um, whereas, unfortunately, the reality was a lot of a lot of mines were on the end of their economic worth. Mm. Yeah. So it's harder to fundraise for that. Yeah. Because um, all you're doing is fundraising for like five more years of mining. They fundraise and they got another thirteen years out of mine, so it makes it more economically viable. And yeah. and yeah, and and again, that just brings us back to that same problem, doesn't it? That mm. actually, what we're talking about, we're not talking about any uh, complete change of society. You know, all we're doing is, you know, it's 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 sort of just stretching things out a little bit longer. Well, that's quite entrepreneurial as well, isn't yeah. it? Mm. That their their version of it works mm. because they happen to have a better resource available. Yeah. Yeah. They happen to have a better business opportunity. Mm. And that's really that's really telling because actually there was a uh, I believe he was. He was a Conservative minister under Thatcher. The name escapes me. He was the Wales secretary. And he he said that he actually wanted to make this an option for all mines. He was saying, we should do this for all mines. We should allow them the right to work the mine if they want. We should allow them to buy it out. Because actually, that, that does fit into a, a neoliberal view yeah. of the world, doesn't it? Like, well... You don't want your mind to close. Okay, put the money up and keep it going then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, you do it yourself. That's fine. Um, but you will carry the economic burden mm. and you will do it, as you said, as entrepreneurs. Yeah. You know? um, I think the idea didn't fly because actually there's no way a conservative government would have sanctioned miners taking over their own industry in whichever way mm. it was presented. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, one thing that... <clears throat> Well, that does strike me about this idea, and I think I think your criticisms are absolutely fair, especially this idea. Well, actually, uh, worker share ownership mm. is a very right wing um, yeah. policy. I mean, it's been used in the states quite a lot to um, basically give workers a sense of sort of ownership of the profitability of a company mm. and promote the idea that you're going to work super super hard as an individual mm. because then you'll get a better dividend. So you're investing in tactic. Yeah, mm. in essence, yeah, it's often given out, isn't it? Because you also they're, they're individual. It's regulated by the market and it's linked to profitability. Three things that have nothing to do with collective action uh, or trade union density. Yeah. Um, but I do wonder if pragmatically this could have been employed as a more widespread strategy, and because only only to the view of the idea that in those areas of England where the collieries did close, where mining collapsed, the social and economic cost has been so huge. Mm. It's been so huge in the terms of the absolute collapse of communities. Um, There was a research paper in the 90s which demonstrated that just on the basis of unemployment benefit that had to be paid out to miners, the economic cost of closing the mines was not worthwhile for the government. Like, it would have been better... It would have been more profitable, or well, maybe profit is a bad word, but it would be more cost efficient mm. to keep a failing mine, in quotation marks, open yeah. than actually keeping all those people on benefits. Mm. And then you have, you know, the crime, the the so, breakdown of social cohesion, the drugs in those communities. Yeah. Um, you know, I uh, I teach uh, in, a, in a community, uh, well, uh, several villages uh, that are ex pit villages, and even sort of two or three generations on, the cost of the collapse of that community is still absolutely devastating for mm-hmm. those people. Um, there's you know multi generational joblessness. Um, drugs are endemic in these communities, um, and these are also often the communities that have been found far right quite appealing. Yeah. Generally, voted Brexit. You know, yeah. who are lost, who who, who feel absolutely. Um, sold out and destroyed by the system so I do wonder if if just if could the NUM actually have turned around towards the end of the the strike and said well maybe we can do this as a kind of last ditch kind of do you think that would have been possible would there have been Scargle going in with like <laughs> members use and going like right we'll buy a bunch of mines then yeah. or do you think there's a lack of uh, political social will for these things well I, I, and maybe this is why having discussions about the concept of ownership is so important because actually you got to think about the trade union movement at that point was absolutely married to the idea of nationalisation nationalisation was everything Yeah. Mm. either it was resisting 
industries being taken out of national control um and you still see it today you know that that is the answer to all the ills ills is nationalization yeah now obviously you know my gut makes me want to just nationalize everything (laughs) (laughs) nationalize greg nationalize greg's most importantly that's that's obviously the the key demand to socialism um but at the same time it it doesn't fix all the problems you know there, there are still issues i mean there's still massive issues in schools, regardless mm. of whether there's academisation or not. Yeah. You know, we still have fights with the government over pay. Yeah. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that if academies were no longer a thing, that wouldn't be an issue. Yeah. Yes, okay, we could say we bargained for all teachers. Yeah. But you, unless you're organised on the ground, that really doesn't matter. Mm. Um, and, and, yeah... It, and I think I think that would have affected the response to that, you know. And actually, I think NUM centrally, I'm guessing I'm really guessing here, but actually, you know, NUM centrally, I bet they would have been like, "Well, no, our policy is we want nationalisation, yeah. so we can't do anything else. Otherwise, it'll weaken our argument." Mind you, yeah. they were, economically, they're probably on their last legs towards the end of the strike yeah. as well, right? Yeah, Cause, yeah, because they really would have had all these miners yeah, yeah. surviving for months and months. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. On, on Paying for all Scargirls massive thing. paintings. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> all tea, no shame. <laughs> oh, but he would have. Maybe he would have loved that Scargirl boss of boss of the. Oh, he would have. Northern mining he powerhouse. Of course, he would have. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. He would have built another statue to himself. Yeah. <laughs> oh my word. Shots fired. <laughs> um, so I do wonder, though. I do wonder if potentially um because nationalization is obviously the thing that we haven't really talked about so far in this podcast and i think there's an obvious reason for that the nationalization really isn't a form of worker ownership Mm. i mean it's an element of democratic oversight an element of democratic oversight that is going on but it's in a real substantive way i don't think you can really argue that that there's a form of workers control going on in there um and, and the Socialist Party listeners immediately turn off. <laughs> <laughs> this is rubbish. I hate this podcast. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so maybe maybe that's a good point to move on because we are kind of talking about national projects and big scale thinking. Um, it's quite, we've kind of gone up in units, haven't we, mm. this podcast? We started off, we were talking about veg shops, <laughs> bicycle cooperatives, <laughs> and then, then we moved into the realm of actually key industries, yeah. coal mining, and now yeah. we're going to have a talk about an actual national plan for workers' ownership. It's almost like we planned these things. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a little kind of obscure idea that came out of the Swedish labour movement on how to socialize the economy uh it was something called the minder plan i'm going to explain how we got that name in a second um i'm going to go into a little bit of detail here because there's a number of key things here that are quite interesting and particularly in the context of potentially a labor government maybe in the next four to eight years who is not just talking about nationalization but has made some hints of seeing worker ownership as part of its policies Mm that this could potentially be something that re-emerges as an area of study, as something to look at. Um, so this, this plan emerged out of, um, basically in, in Sweden you have, uh, well certainly at the time of the plan, there were only really two trade unions, two big industrial trade unions. There was a professional union and there's a blue collar trade union. And it was the blue collar trade union, the uh, Landsorganisationen, that's my best. That's really terrible, isn't it? That's my best attempt. That's even like the English spelling, and I still <laughs> fucked it up. You know what? Sorry. I was, I was, I was trying to, dis- I was trying to pronounce the name of the colliery in Welsh. <laughs> yeah. I gave up. Oh, I dear. gave up. Right. Okay. Sorry, sorry Swedish So L- Lydia wins because she actually yeah. said the Spanish word. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think I might have said it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Email us. Let us know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the blue collar trade union is very closely aligned, like like in the UK, to the Swedish uh, Social Democratic Party. Um, now it's worth mentioning that historically, Sweden has very high union density, 
um, compared to the UK. And, and that is part of the context as to where this plan comes from. So um, I pulled up some statistics. 2006, which was a particular high point um, in the millennial period, 77% trade union density. Uh, 2017, uh, which is the last time there was figures, 61% trade union density uh, compared to the UK's 23%. For 2017 so you can see already it's a massive difference um they also the swedish trade unions in 2017 claim 90 percent coverage on their collective bargaining agreements so even if workers aren't members 90 percent of the workforce are covered by some kind of collective bargaining agreement so this is a very different organizational uh context um sweden is also home uh, to europe's largest syndicalist trade union federation the sac sac um which i don't know i i tried to find some information maybe some people are more familiar with the sac can let us know i tried to find some information about um what sac felt about the minor plan and how they interacted you're laughing at sac as soon as i look around at you as soon as i look around at you oh god you can't put that in the podcast <laughs> So I tried to find some information about how <laughs> SAC, Thank SAC you. Thank you. I um, that. felt about this plan. I couldn't really find much. I did find a pamphlet from around the time period that said that they wanted to give the existing industrial democracy a more socialist direction. So I, I give the sense that they were aware of this plan and they, they kind of liked it, but they wanted to push it further. So where does it come from? Well, um, the, the trade union, the LO, had two key economists, Rudolf Meidner and Gusta Ren, um, and they basically articulated a Swedish version of Keynesianism. So Keynesianism, we don't really need to go into huge detail now, but Keynes was an economic, ec economist uh, post-World War II, articulated the idea that you could have a welfare state through basically the state borrowing money, investing in welfare, investing in national products, pro projects. This would stimulate the economy and create a virtuous cycle where basically workers' living standards, wages were going up, but also the state was growing the economy. Um, this was um, founded on the principle of, a, of a basically a social compromise. So basically trade unions, organised labour and capitalists have to cooperate for this to work. And that was kind of what was proposed in Sweden, that... The trade unions would exercise wage restraint, so they wouldn't ask for higher wages. And in response, um, the state would invest in welfare. And this is what happened. What was slightly different from the British context is they had something called wages solidarity was part of this principle, which is a slightly different way. So in the UK, there was wage restraint throughout the 70s. So there were lots of like key, very profitable industries that were basically not asking for higher wages under the idea that the welfare state was gonna be developed. What they did instead is they proposed, proposed, proposed this model of wages solidarity where they basically said whatever company, whatever industry you're, you're working for, you will be paid the same as any other worker in that industry. So that means if you were in a particular profitable firm, you got paid the same as someone who was in a firm that wasn't making that much money. Mm -hmm. um, the end result was it was kind of wage restraint, but it was kind of fairer. Mm -hmm. So because all workers who were doing similar work were basically paid the same. And there was a lesser kind of random thing of, oh, I happen to be working for a really good company or one that's making lots of money. The problem, and actually Meidner did artic articulate this at the time, he said, there's solidarity in wages, but there's no solidarity in profits, like any capitalist system. So basically there was a few Swedish families who, because of wage restraint, were making huge, huge amounts of money. And there was a massive concentration of wealth in Swedish elites over the 1970s. So, 1976, the Meidner Group puts a proposal forward to the Trade Union Congress, and this is the Meidner Plan. Now, the idea was basically to set up wage earner funds consisting of trade union members' funds that would, over time, buy or negotiate larger and larger shares in key industries until, eventually, they became the majority share owners of those industri industries. Something they were very optimistic about. They anticipated that they would own the majority shareholders in key industries within a few decades. So they said, if we put this in place, actually, we will have a work run economy of sorts mm -hmm. within 15, 20 years. Another interesting part of the plan in the intermediate period, obviously, if you're a shareholder, you get dividends, you get dividends from the profits. They propo proposed that 
any money that was generated from the wage earner funds would be not only reinvested in acquiring more shares for more ownership, but would be challenged, sorry, channeled towards funding research, expertise, education and training for workers in preparation for running an industry. So let's say you're buying shares in coal, you're buying shares in oil, you're buying shares in transportations and logistics, you would then be investing your money in getting those lorry drivers, getting those coal miners, getting those people working in uh, energy factories to basically train them, this is how you run this industry in the future, and this is how you take control of it. Um, that was the idea. Now the problem, why it never came to pass, was basically the political response. So whereas the first two examples we've talked about in the podcast, we've, the econ the economically there's been problems, this one never really, the economics weren't tested because politically there was a challenge. Um, the first challenge was from the Swedish Social Democratic Party itself, which wasn't really hot on this plan, um, didn't really endorse it very strongly, um, and really didn't want to campaign on it in support of it. Um, so it was much stronger. It was much stronger support in the trade union movement than in the um, in the political party. They ran the election, and actually, um, in the next election that followed, I think it was nineteen. So let me think, the plan came forward. So I think it was 78, someone can maybe correct me if I've got that wrong, but I think it was 78, the election. Social Democratic Party obviously didn't want to campaign on this, but this was part of his, pla uh, of his platform. People knew that the MIDA plan was something that was being proposed. They actually won the most votes. They remained the largest party, but the right and centre parties were so scared of this plan and this plan being put in um, place that for the first time in Swedish history, they formed a right-wing coalition mm. of all of the oppositional parties wow. and basically blocked the Social Democrats from forming a government, even though the Social Democrats had a majority vote. Um, and they were using very specifically the Minder Plan as a way to do this. They were basically saying, all elements of the Liberal, Centre and Right, we need to work together because if we let the Social Democrats get in power, they're going to put in the Minder Plan, mm. even if, even though the Social Democrats were lukewarm on it anyway, they were using it in that way. Um, so Swedish Social Democrats don't really have a chance to contest an election again until 1983. Um, by that time, the minor plan is watered down considerably and actually it very closely resembles what we've already talked about in terms of worker share ownership. Yeah. That's what they were proposing instead. They said, we're not gonna, it's not gonna be about owning industry. Mm. It's gonna be workers will have a share. A bit kind of like the John Lewis model yeah. Yeah. in the UK, kind of the like kind that. Of partnership um, thing. Exactly, and then it wasn't really a fair. Now, the final point is one of the really interesting aspects of this history um, is that the Swedish Employers Association, which is basically the Swedish version of the CBI, so the, the lobby group for business in Sweden, launched a massive ideological offensive against the plan when it was put forward. Um, they founded publishing houses, advertising agencies, an educational infrastructure that still exists to this day, all all promoting. Oh, they were at music municipal fairs, the youth <laughs> and student groups. Wow! They went around the country and they they basically campaigned for individualism, free enterprise, and entrepreneurship. And they basically said the minor plan is going to br bring Eastern Bloc socialism to Sweden. You need to be scared. It's all about capitalism. Capitalism is where it's at. Lenin is coming. Yeah, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and actually, one of the pub publishing houses that comes out of this huge um, counter-offensive against the Maida plan, which is called uh, Timbro, actually is an important ally of comparative projects that exist in Britain and America today and are having an important role today. So the Institute of Ec Economic Affairs mm -hmm. was, oh, wow. was, was wow. allied to this counter-offensive. So... Um, in essence, you have a combination of kind of political dismantlement of it through that historic coalition of right-wing parties, but also a massive cultural offensive mm. to basically undermine on a on a social basis any support for this. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's lots of interesting um, points to be raised there. Well, I just found it fascinating that like this 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 isn't this isn't explored a lot. And I guess it mm. does come back to some of those points we were saying earlier that the, it, the ideas of ownership aren't really a concept discussed inside the trade union movement anymore. It's, it, you know, it, and that has a lot to do with confidence. Yeah, you know, it has a lot to do with the fact that 
this just isn't a topic of conversation that you raise in the trade union movement. But the response is absolutely fascinating there. The fact that the entire political establishment organised around this, yeah. built around this, reacted to this in such a powerful way that's lasted until today, some 40 years later. Yeah. Says everything, doesn't it? You yeah. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's a lot of issues with that, but I can understand why, why, why Sack liked this idea because it is, it is, trade union ownership of industry. Yeah. It's not through, it's not, it's not through a different setting. It is, it is pure and simple trade unions taking ownership. Now there's a lot of issues with it because it's not very, much, it's not exactly organizing strength it's not building strength and actually i think probably my main criticism would be that actually even if you did manage to get it off the ground and you did manage to buy all these industries you wouldn't have the organization on the ground mm. to defend it because what's the next step in revolution counter-revolution yeah the, the capitalists would just take back those industries and yeah. say i don't care whether you've got shares or not yeah that's ours now. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And but but it but it's fascinating because it, it shows a real insight into going, right, we need to get to grips with taking ownership of industry. We need to take control of this. And and that's why it's such a fascinating fascinating idea and, and something that I think needs looking at in more detail, you know. How 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 do we apply those kind of ideas? And actually some of those ideas around actually just building consensus around ownership. Could you imagine a motion going to TUC uh, in September's TUC conference about ownership? Like, could you imagine a union even putting that forward? Yeah. You know, saying, oh, we need to take ownership of Industry X. Mm. You know, like, who's going to go, oh, yeah, great, yeah, nice one. That's it's definitely. just not on the radar, no. is it? No. And even I... with the Labour Party starting to make noises about worker ownership. Yeah. And I don't... Yeah, go on. Because that... Um... That Labour Party report that came out, uh, I don't know whether it was this year or last year, the um, Alternative Models of Ownership um, document is really, it mean, far be it from me to praise the Labour Party. <laughs> Just like, take a deep <laughs> That's breath. That's my job. That's my job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. <laughs> um, um, but it's, it is really interesting. Um I wonder how, what the, you know, if any of this stuff will kind of get picked up before the next election, whether we'll see a similar kind of scaremongering campaign from, like, from the Tories, from the right, over some of the proposals made um, in this, uh, in this document. So I do, I mean, I think it is kind of, uh, I don't know, I think it's, I think people are starting to talk about it more. I've definitely seen more discussion of it maybe not in such a radical way as we would want but definitely in a kind of from a similar stance to the um to the Meidner plan a kind of more social democratic stance and there's a history of that in this country as well I mean one of the reasons Harold Harold Wilson was so unpopular with the right and the centre and 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 organised against by the political establishment was because one of his one of the grounding principles of his government was introducing trade unions into boards of industry and giving them influence mm. in boards of industry. You know, obviously that's a much more watered down version of this, yeah. but it, it 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 does it does get to the essence of this, doesn't it? That talking about ideas of ownership, talking about anything to do with ownership is clearly a revolutionary act. Mm. Is clearly something which challenges the status quo. And that in itself is the indictment of of cooperatives being the answer to questions of ownership because it doesn't mm. have that at its core. Yeah. It doesn't challenge society at its core. Mm. What challenge society is its core is ideas like this that say we are taking industry back. Mm. We are going to own industry and make decisions on it. Yeah. I mean so I think I think that's absolutely right. I think possibly these questions don't have to be posed in such a radical way. I think they are radical. They are radical, absolutely. But actually, the common sense around this is so strong yeah. that you could have a conversation with someone about, well, do you think you need a decent wage for the work you do? And they say, 
Yeah, I should get a decent wage for the work I do. If I work hard, I should get a decent wage. The notion, well, do you think you should have, if you've been in a company for a long time and you've worked there for a long time and you work really hard, don't you think you should have a say about how it's run? Actually, that's not that unreasonable, mm. really, is it? No. Fundamentally, that's not that unreasonable. Yeah. But And it feels very natural as well. Yeah, but actually, it's put, it, it is radical to yeah. say that. Absolutely radical. And there's reasons for that. Um, the two questions, the two kind of potential criticisms that, that occurred to me when I was doing the research into the Minder Plan. The first was, I think, oh, we've kind of acknowledged this, the political... Um, the political response would probably be the same in every country, yeah. I think. Um, one thing that occurred to me was states are very good at, at certain critical points saying that's a strategic industry. Mm. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's for national def defence tends to yeah, be the yeah. last resort, yeah. right, doesn't yeah. it? Because yeah. essentially that is the, the, the reason the state exists mm. is to de defend class interest and national interest. Yeah. So they tend to, at sp certain specific points when things are getting a little bit too... Uh, hairy say <laughs> no no strategic lateral interest blah, mm. blah, blah. Mm. Um, the other thing which we haven't really discussed in relation to the any of the examples so far is actually this was okay so this was proposed in the 1970s uh, like I said very high trade union density lots of manufacturing industry as well mm. um, obviously there is trade going on but to, to most of the economic activity at that time is happening in Sweden the economy that we live in now is, you know, ge geographically so diverse, right? It's global supply chains. One of the things that maybe is worth thinking about is actually where does ownership fit in when, uh, okay, let's say you're manufacturing a car, when the car parts are made in China, yeah. they're, f they're finished in India, they then come and assembled in the UK and then they're so sold in France, you know, mm -hmm. and then your advertising agency is German. You know, it it makes it very difficult, doesn't it, to organise in that framework. Yeah. Um, so I mean, this is this is this is the issue with globalisation, right? Isn't it that that ultimately it is a massive defender of class interest because it allows the employing class to work, operate across across boundaries that slow us down or stop us altogether, um, and that's that that obviously that obviously causes issue for any idea of ownership um, and why you have to think about things in a global way and why we have to work with unions across borders mm. or you know, international unions, for example. Even even, even IWW, <laughs> that, 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 that would work. Oh, God, that would work. People do often accidentally it, call us in, what is it, international inter workers yeah. of the world. That's all. That's all. That's we're, we're so, yeah. We're such internationalists. We have it twice. <laughs> <in the name. laughs> yeah, that's the one. Yeah, international workers of the world. The bane of my yeah. life. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Well, um, well, that brings it to a nice close. Um, so you've been listening to Talking Shop, and we today we've been discussing the question of ownership. Uh, next time. We are going to be looking at uh, sex work and the well, the, the qualities of the set of the industry, but also talking to someone who is organising sex workers and is a sex worker themselves. And we're going to kind of get into the the controversies, the debates, the discussions about um, the issues related to that. So it should be quite an exciting mm. podcast. Um, I will, as always, pass over to Dave, <laughs> who has assured me that he's actually prepared. <laughs> something to go i think the unprepared ones are quite they were i mean they i felt super awkward <laughs> on the last one so i actually did some research this time yeah and i looked into a variety of different sign-offs <laughs> and some of the most popular sign-offs from newscasters uh throughout the years um but <laughs> there was there was endless options um but i think Given the discussion of uh, globalisation, I'm going to use the one from uh, Dan Rather, who took over from uh, Walter Cronkite. Okay. Um, famous newscaster. And he would sign off by saying, and that's a part of our world. <laughs> so there you go. There you go. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. It what does. It's perfect. It's perfect.
We were talking about globalisation. It says okay. world in it. <laughs> I'm going to come up with a really good one next time. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm going to keep looking. It's fine. I like the uh, fact the fact that you said, I'm going to come up with a really good oh, one was a oh, very no, tacit admission that yeah. was very good. That was a really good one. Oh, damn it. I found a really good one. No, I'll save that one for next time. Okay. Yeah. A little bit of hype. Yeah. Keep it, yeah, keep looking. Yeah. Now we're going to hype it up. Yeah, it's going to be, the next one will be perfect. <laughs> what a cliffhanger to end on. Yeah. So uh, you have been listening to Talking Shop. Uh, see you later. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Talking Shop, a podcast by New Syndicalists for trade union activists and organisers. If you'd like to listen to previous episodes or review our other content, please check out our website, newsyndicalist.org. You can also keep updated on future episodes through subscribing to our podcast via Acast, iTunes or Stitcher. While you're there, why not leave us a review to help us find more people like yourself? If you have a suggestion for future content, would like to submit your own ideas, or would like to discuss any of the ideas raised in this or previous episodes, please contact us at newsyndicalist at gmail.com. Thanks again. Bye.